Good evening and welcome to the conference call of Hindustan Unilever Limited. We will be covering this evening results for the quarter ended 30th June 2020. On the call from HUL end is Mr. Sanjeev Mehta, Chairman and Managing Director, and Mr. Srinivas Patak, Chief Financial Officer, HUL. We hope that you are staying safe and keeping healthy in these uncertain times. Given the exceptional circumstances created by COVID-19 outbreak, we are presenting results from our respective homes, so please bear with us if things are not as smooth as usual. As is customary, we will start the presentation with Sanjeev sharing his perspective on market and an overview on how we are managing business through the impact of COVID-19. Then Srinivas will share with you aspects of our performance for the quarter and our outlook for the future. Before we get started with the presentation, I would like to draw your attention to the safe harbor statement included in the presentation for good order sake. With that, over to you, Sanjeev. Thank you, Amit. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us on the call today. I do hope that you and your loved ones are staying safe and keeping well in these uncertain times. This is a societal crisis threatening lives and the well-being of our society with the potential to fundamentally reshape the world. On behalf of everyone at HUL, we extend our deepest sympathies to all those who are struggling to cope with the crisis, and equally, we express our gratitude to all the frontline heroes in managing and helping us manage this pandemic. One of the unusual features of this crisis is how it feels like the world is at a standstill, yet things are also changing at such incredible speed. It is in this context of rapid and unpredictable change that we are discovering true responsiveness of HQL and the value of consumers to consumers. As a company, we are privileged to be serving the everyday needs of consumers. We hail our own frontline heroes in factories and in sales who have been working tirelessly even during the peak of the lockdown with a higher purpose of ensuring availability of essential like life wise soaps and sanitizers, domestic disinfectants to fight the virus and a good cup of red devil natural care tea or horlicks to boost your immunity. Now let me take you to the market context and the imperative for navigating through this crisis in detail. The economic fallout of this crisis is inevitable. In India, the economy has slowed down even before COVID-19. With the pandemic and ensuing nationwide lockdown, the immediate impact was severe supply chain constraints. As businesses pulled down shutters, it manifested in empty shelves and shrinking pipelines. From a demand perspective, the fear of loss of jobs, dwindling earnings, and eroding investments have made people circumspect with their spend. Progressively, as the country started opening up, the lopsided concentration of cases implied a shift from absolute lockdown to more localized lockdowns or vertical lockdowns. And as you can see in the chart, the number of cases continue to rise the macroeconomic environment is becoming more challenging with slowing GDP growth rates. We should be absolutely clear that no one can predict with a high degree of accuracy of what is going to happen. A lot will depend on the trajectory of the virus, what happens to the economy, to what extent is the demand postponed or impaired, the unemployment trend, etc. So there are various variables at play. I would not want to hazard a guess, but I do hope that by the end of this year or early next year, we will see the economy picking up and the demand coming back. Right now, the challenge for us is to get the supply lines going. It is difficult to gauge the end consumer level demand. Once supply is normalized and trade pipelines fill up, we will get to understand the underlying demand trend hopefully in the September quarter. Steps taken by the government, such as increasing daily wage rate under Manrega, increasing the budget allocation, are all positive and should boost rural consumption. We are also delighted that the harvest has been good. Similarly, the steps taken to provide liquidity by underwriting loans to MSMEs is also a step in the right direction. We are hopeful that the government will take necessary steps to stimulate demand. We are a consumption-driven economy, and it is vital to get the consumption going so the economy gets into a virtuous spiral. Food and currency continue to be volatile due to geopolitical imperatives, unprecedented swings in global economic cycles and trade dynamics. We are also witnessing inflationary trends in select commodities, such as vegetable oil, tea, S&P, and tomato paste. Our strategy is serving us well. 
it remains unchanged, our agenda. We continue to dynamically manage the business to deliver consistent, competitive, profitable, and responsible growth. A high growth fundamental is the key lever for driving growth across the categories. These are, as you know, purposeful brands, improved penetration, impactful innovation, designed for channel and fuel for growth. We continue to progress a purpose-led and future-fit agenda, which is even more critical during this time. And reimagining HUL is critical to drive digital transformation in all aspects of operation. I believe we have made good progress in our focus area. Last quarter, we have called out five imperatives which draw strength from our values and enable us to navigate through this difficult circumstance. Let me share with you the snapshot of a progress in all the five old streams of people, supply, demand, community, cost, and cash. The most important priority for us is and will remain the safety of the people, not just people who are on our roads, but the entire ecosystem that works for us. Based on our global best practices, the WSO guidelines and the government requirements, we set up and implement a tiered SOP for health and safety in operations accompanied with training and readiness will to ensure that we minimize the risk of transmission across the value chain from suppliers to customers. We set up contactless operations at the interfaces where risk providers and risk is higher. We also set up a supply chain to deliver more than 5 million PPR, PPE items within our ecosystem to support 100% compliance to all class health and safety standards. We were one of the first companies to provide insurance to our distributor sales team. There is no debate on cost when it comes to people's safety. This has and will always be the philosophy of the organization. This is all the precautions you can take. There will be instances, like in a Haridwar factory, when the infection will spread, about, will spread amongst the people, and more so because people are asymptomatic. In all such instances, our first focus is to go get all our people tested and look after our people who are tested positive. Decontaminate the premises and restart the operation only with people who tested negative. We are also clear that we will not be in a rush to open our offices. We are also trying to innovate across our financial level. For example, we have implemented the entire internship program virtually. This is also an opportunity to train and retrain our people. We, in fact, have seen a huge spike in the usage of a learning process. The second important aspect has been to keep the supply lines going. I'm extremely proud of my team for the way they've risen to the occasion and have adopted new and innovative practices. We were able to restore operations with an accuracy after the precipitous drop in operating level with nationwide lockdown. We sharpened the entire planning to execution cycle to a daily horizon and ensure the dynamic response to an everyday changing environment. Over 100 instances of critical material supply disruption were handled with speed by onboarding dozens of new suppliers. Actual trucking capacity was restored at twice the rate of national trucking recovery, thereby eliminating key logistic bottlenecks from operational loss to. A supply chain today is well positioned both on just in time and just in case requirements. In June, we were also able to build back a distributor stock pipeline, which had reduced significantly towards the end of March due to the lockdown. The third important area for us has been to keep a pulse on our computer the behavior, perception, the unmet needs, so that we can adjust our innovation and communication agenda. To address the critical needs in the space of health hygiene and nutrition, we have brought in market. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have been able to assess the demands for our people, for our categories. We have also accelerated our innovation pipeline in the health and IT category. And this quarter, we launched Lifebuoy germ kill spray and Domex disinfectant surveys uh, and Lifebuoy cloth sanitizer. Fourth and most important aspect is helping the community. This is a crisis where business, civil society, and citizens must join hands with the government. As you would recall us saying, it is a purpose to go beyond the business and ensure that we use our scheme and brand as a force for good to the society. As a responsible company, we stand united with the nation in the fight against the virus. Last but not the least has been a heightened focus on cost and cash. Even though we are one of the most valuable companies in the country, 
we pride ourselves in being a frugal organization with a middle class mindset. Our balance sheet strength will be a source of competitive advantage. We are driving cost agility, judiciously reviewing cash flows, and reallocating spends with rigorous discipline. And Srini will throw more light on our debt PL management in the latter part of this presentation. We have taken significant steps to reduce complexity in operations. We have reduced by nearly 80% uh, SKUs during the height of the national lockdown. As the country started to open up gradually, we increased our SKU assortment, and we are currently operating at about 50% of our pre COVID level. Every crisis we believe, while posing a danger, also provides opportunity. We are leveraging this opportunity to reduce the complexity in operations. And we believe that even as we go forward, we will bring down the SQUs to about 80% of our pre COVID level. There is a clear financial case for this in terms of cost, cash, and organization bandwidth. This measures will enable us to respond to speed and agility in an evolving environment. We also responded with agility to major shifts in consumer demand. As an illustration, the production of sanitizers was ramped up by a factor of 100x and hand washed by 5x. The golden triangle of procurement quality in R&D enabled us to qualify and tap scores of new plant design, new material, new formulations, and prototypes. We launched over 50 new product and pack innovations to cater to the rapid changes in demand in hygiene and sanitization products. We also formed tactical sourcing alliances to utilize spare capacity for addressing the categories of health hygiene and nutrition that are seeing demand of more. Several innovative disaggregation models of distribution were also tested and launched to ensure that supplies reach the furthest corners of the country. More importantly, the most we've been building under a reimagined HUL digital agenda has been a clear competitive advantage during the crisis. A B2B app, Shikha, is now available in more than 150,000 stores. And a retail offering, My Kirana, is also available across many pockets of six cities. This has been a clear competitive advantage for us, with Chica tracking almost double the average order value and line items per order compared to pre COVID levels. The merger of DSK Consumer Health Nutrition Business with us has brought great brands, built on proven scientific credentials with great purpose into our fold. This merger could not have come at a better time. We are privileged to address the nutrition and immunity needs of consumers in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic. A merger of this scale requires sharp focus, and our team has delivered seamless support. Despite the lockdown, we were able to successfully close and consummate the merger on the point of day of 1st April with all activities, including the legal transfers and IT systems transition, orchestrated virtually and flowing seamlessly. The nutrition business is off to a good start, with domestic business delivering a robust 5% growth in the quarter and tracking well ahead of market on back of volume share gains. Within a few weeks of GSK merger, we reformulated the full Hardlex portfolio with a higher level of zinc, updated the packs, and communicated the benefit of immunity, supporting nutrients like vitamin C, D, and zinc. We also launched pouch packs in all this and boost to drive consumer value and build access. The structural growth and margin opportunity with this merger remains intact, and we continue to make good progress against the monster. This pandemic can have a lasting impact on human behavior. One clear trend, of course, is a heightened awareness of hygiene. The pandemic has clearly raised the need for clean living, protection, immunity, and wellness. With iconic trusted brands such as Lifeway, Domex, Solix, Red Label, Surf Excel, Around 80% of our portfolio addresses the space of health, hygiene, and nutrition needs of consumers. We have seen in India and in many other global markets that consumers at this time do gravitate, gravitate towards large and trusted brands. And there is no other company in India which has built many such brands over the years that deliver strong functional benefits and instill trust and confidence in consumers. Right now, people are grappling with a sense of fear of getting infected and hence they will remain wary of going out for some time. This gives a fillip to in-home consumption categories, and we are well placed with our in-home portfolio of ketchup, jam, soup, tea, coffee, and offer. 
With the incomes under pressure, when economic uncertainty, consumers will gravitate towards conscious consumption and search for value in each purchase occasion. A portfolio across categories straddles the career pyramid and caters to different price points and benefit segments. Hence, even in this difficult time, we as a business are placed to meet all needs of consumers, even if they were to downgrade and downgrade. The crisis has also massive opportunities for e-everything. I've spoken about the Shikara app and the digital orders that are taken directly from retail outlets, given the social distancing norms, mobility restrictions, and sales for manpower issues. My Kirana is currently, like I said, in more than six cities and proven very helpful. In light of the current environment, we've converted to a complete digital marketing and home delivery-led model. With smart pick, we are resorting to new ways of driving market development to targeted digital sampling. Smart pick delivers a sample box of HUL brands, specially curated to algorithms, and is targeted to the consumers through a digitally enabled end-to-end -end experience. Not just traditional e-commerce, but it could also be the possible renaissance of the humble grocer. Consumers have realized the benefit of proximity. With Connected Stores program under a reimagining HUL agenda, we are empowering the growth of the technology. Connected Stores provides a brand agnostic platform for the stores to go digital, capture online orders, digitize its billing, and offer the option of digital payments to shoppers. Against the challenging market backdrop, we believe we have delivered a resilient and competitive performance in the quarter. I reported turnover growth to the 4%, including the impact of merger of GSK consumer health. Excluding for this nutrition business, our domestic consumer growth declined by 7%. With the headwind on cost, we saw 110 bits decline in EBITDA margins. Nonetheless, our EBITDA margins are healthy at 25%. Our performance is a reflection of the strength of brands, execution, progress, and rigor, and discipline in implementing a consistent strategy. While we continue to focus on delivering consistent, competitive, profitable, and responsible growth, our compass is calibrated by sense of purpose. When COVID-19 hit India, we immediately earmarked to be 100 crores to help the country fight this crisis. And we are spending the money in a systematic way. We are helping augment the capacity of healthcare infrastructure by donating several ventilators and about 75,000 RT-PCR test kits to hospitals. In utilizing a pan India reach to distribute food and sanitation kits kit to needy people both in urban and rural India. The first 150,000 packs of Horlicks with higher zinc was donated to hospitals across the nation for the benefit of medical care professionals taking care of the COVID patients. We also donated two crore soaps across India to hospitals and vulnerable communities. We also partnered with Apollo Hospital to set up isolation facilities. Finally, we are a marketing company and have expertise in changing consumer behavior. We are utilizing our products in partnership with UNICEF to come out with mass communication, with campaigns which we were featured memorable and positive messages that were the need of our reaching over 100 million households. Looking forward, while the near-term market outlook is extremely uncertain, we are confident of the medium to long-term growth prospects of the FMDG sector. The strength of the ability and responsiveness gives us confidence to navigate the current challenges as well as capture the structural opportunity in medium to long term. With that, let me hand it over to my colleague, Srini, to cover the details of the quarter's performance. Over to you, Srini. Uh, thank you, Sanjeev, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so the quarter for us, I think, has been uh, business most unusual, both on growth and cost. And the end results are indeed satisfying, given the current context and the environment. As Sanjeev explained, agility and responsiveness across the value chain has enabled us to stabilize the operations and deliver a competitive performance. Our reported turnover growth stood at 4%, including nutrition, which is a GSK merger, on a like-for-like -like basis, excluding the impact of the merger, our domestic consumer growth declined by about 7%, and the UVG decline was about 8 Our competitive is, competitiveness is key, and in, in this regard, 86% of our business is winning share on volume when we compare on the last three months' basis as per the Kantar World Panel. 
as you would be all be aware that given the challenges and the limitations and the restrictions, uh, Nielsen data is not available and, and likely to be so for the next couple of months. And to that extent, therefore, the consumer panel becomes an important indicator for us to look at our competitiveness. And even on value terms, around 80% of our business is actually gaining share in the last three months. It's important to understand the construct of growth uh, about 80% of our business addresses the health, hygiene, and nutrition needs of the consumers, and this has grown at about 6%. However, the out-of-home consumption being impacted and some disproportionate impact on discretionary categories, the remaining 20% saw an adverse impact, dragging the overall growth down to a negative 7. I will talk more about this when we come to the later slides in the presentation. In terms of month-wise progression, uh, April was at about 70% uh, from an operational perspective uh, due to the lockdown and restrictions and, and, and our manufacturing only being limited. We saw a relative better performance in May and in June our growth was in the mid-single digit growth as we recovered lost distribution inventory. We also benefited from rationalizing trade spends and this has enabled top line growth. Now in September quarter, with the trade pipelines normalizing, which is pretty much we're referring to our distributor pipelines here, we need to get a better sense of the underlying demand, and that becomes critical. Let me give you a bit of a flavor on the bottom line. Uh, from an EBITDA perspective, we delivered about 2,644 crores. And, and now let me split the EBITDA margins. Uh, and these are some sections where I will ask you to just focus, because I'm going to call out some important elements. Uh, so when you really look at our EBITDA margin decline on our base business, the decline was about 170 basis points. And we got a benefit of about 60 basis points coming from a nutrition business, which therefore translates to about 110 basis points on an overall basis. So this chart, what you really see is all these numbers are reported. From a growth perspective, we have called out what is the reported growth and what is the growth excluding the M&A effect. Uh, therefore, you've seen that from a net profit perspective at 1,881 crores, we were up about 7%. Uh, important to highlight two one-off uh, or, or exceptional items here. We have received the benefit of some prior period assessments in the tax line, uh, approximating to about 96 crores. And you would also see an increase in the exceptional cost due to MNA, which is predominantly related to the stamp duty cost for uh, Horlicks, or for the GSK acquisition and for BWASH, and there are also integration costs which are there. Uh, I think this gives you a very good snapshot picture uh, across the three divisions, and therefore I think the headline message is that health, hygiene, and nutrition have performed well. Having said that, the headline numbers do not do a full justice to the story, and we will unpeel this to give you a better flavor when we talk through from a divisional perspective. I think mean, let me first start with home care. Uh, home care has delivered a solid performance across household care and fabric wash. Uh, household care delivered strong performance in the home and hygiene portfolio driven by penetration. Uh, this has been a key one and it has delivered good growth. Domex is staying true to its purpose, is spreading awareness about the importance of home hygiene and its credentials are resonating well with the consumers. Fabric wash registered a steady performance across the mass and the premium portfolio. Our laundry portfolio straddling the price pyramid benefit holds us in good stead and enables us to activate relevant parts to match consumer needs. For example, our Surf Excel band continued to remain consumer relevant with access offer packs and a contextual messaging through the Ghar Pe Hi Rehenge campaign. Purifiers, uh, due to its consumer durables, uh, durables nature and, and given the restrictions in terms of, of many of the stores being uh, shut, was severely impacted in the quarter, pulling down the overall growth rate. Uh, when I talk about from, from a beauty and a personal care point of view, uh, skin care was clearly an outperformer, and we had a stellar performance given the heightened awareness around hand hygiene. Uh, growth was really led by uh, our purpose-led brands such as Lifeboy and Hamam. Lifeboy grew in strong double digits and across all the formats. Oral care had good growth delivery during the quarter, with accelerated momentum on, uh, on close-up. Hair category was initially impacted, uh, primarily coming because we couldn't manufacture in the month of April, 
and we also saw some bit of pressure in oral care uh, in hair care in terms of large bottles but we started to see the demand pick up in the later half of the quarter we are also confident uh, about this category as it forms part of consumers consideration set for hygiene needs in the current context in color cosmetics and deodorants were adversely impacted both on account of supply constraints and muted consumer demand in the discretionary category having said that we have started to see some green shoots in skin care now if i come to foods and refreshments uh, clearly i think consumer trends of in home wellness and immunity augur well for our foods and refreshments business uh, important to highlight here that our foods business delivered broad based double digit growth driven by consumption shifting to in home our tea and coffee portfolio also registered strong double digit growth red label extended its long running taste of togetherness campaign through a simple yet contemporary message of we can be socially connected even when we are physically distant as sanjeev already called out our nutrition business performed well with big single digit top line growth our immunity was boost immunity boosting horlicks was added with zinc was launched in the quarter Uh, having said that, our out-of-home business, which includes ice creams, food solutions, and vending, was adversely impacted given the out-of-home consumption. I think it's also important to clarify when we say that Horlicks or the GSK portfolio domestic consumer growth has been about five percent. Uh, I think to give it into a, in a, into a perspective, there is no base yeah, because the whole business comes in and gets added into our financials only from first of April. what we've done is actually use the june quarter numbers reported by by gsk in the prior year and compared it with the current set of numbers to give you a flavor and and that's really the definition for a 5% growth yeah i hope that clarifies for you when you when you think about it in the overall context i think i think this is an important chart uh, given what's really happening in the marketplace and to give a better understanding and appreciation of consumers we actually split our portfolio into three different segments Health hygiene is really what consumers are looking for, and this has actually grown at about six percent while addressing the critical needs of our consumers. Now, on the other hand, fifteen percent of our business comes from discretionary segments such as skin, color, and deodorants, and this has actually registered a decline of forty-five percent. A big impact of this was lack of supply, especially in April and parts of May. There's also been some adverse impact on demand as people have remained at home. We are confident that skin will soon see a step up. Colors and deodorants are likely to remain a bit muted for some more time. Our out-of-home categories such as water, ice cream, food solutions, and vending business, while they contribute only about five percent to our business, were disproportionately impacted due to consumption loss and saw a decline of sixty-nine percent. I think the recovery in this part of the segment will be linked to what happens uh, to the overall spread of the virus. Uh, let me now shift focus to the PNL and 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 make some important aspects here. Uh, we have had many headwinds on cost, uh, be it adverse mix, both from a category perspective and as well as pack. You also saw that we operated with what is a consumer relevant packs, which has meant that making different choices in different parts of the country. We've had the fixed cost leverage and increased cost of operations because of supply resilience as well as safety. In order to navigate these headwinds, we stepped up our cost agility, and we have taken various steps to stretch and dial up our savings. And Sanjeev has actually spoken about the methodology and the philosophy that we operate when we look at this. We have indeed calibrated our BMI spends. Uh, so, if you really see in the month of April, we had taken a big reduction. However, we continue to invest back as the country started to open up. and in doing all of this we maintained competitiveness in a throughout basis so so when you really start looking at it on a year on year basis our share of spends and share of voice is actually higher than what we did in june quarter 19 i'm also very happy to share that the synergy benefits from the nutrition business are ahead of the business case when it comes to understanding the cost at a line level Uh, and therefore the margins this quarter will be a bit complicated yeah? it will not fit into your normal trend lines which you would actually uh, input into your models and and extrapolate uh and and let me give you a little bit of a nature of what happens and and here is where i request your indulgence because this is an important point uh, if you don't catch this we'll have lots of questions and i and i really want to take this head on 
let me first talk about our base business, which is excluding nutrition. Yeah, and it's got lots of elements, moving parts, even on a normal basis. We talked about adverse mix. We talked about deleverage. Uh, we talked a lot about the COVID on costs. We also had commodity headwinds in vegetable oils and tea. We did not see the full benefit of lower crude uh, given some of our stock positions and inventory which we had. Then I also talked about rephasing of some of our BMI expenses and calibrating our expenses. Uh, there was also a bit of a step up and phasing in terms of our CSR spends as we looked at it from the point of view of HUL in the fight against, uh, against COVID. Yeah, so that starts to give you a bit of a flavor of, of many ins and outs from the perspective of our base business, which is excluding nutrition. The nutrition business, if I now focus on it, also had certain adverse impact coming from mix and inflation. Uh, there were significant on costs in key items such as SMP. However, we were able to take out a lot of savings in BMI and overheads. The benefits of scale and the benefits of HU and media buying started to come in right from day one. There are no royalty payouts given that uh, we, had, we had bought the brand effect, the Horlicks brand effective first April. And this helped us actually handle the higher cost of transition services. We are actually paying for IT and some of the transition services to GSK till we switch over to SAP. So this will continue for a period of one year. In addition, we've also had changes to our OTC service income. While the net margins were maintained, there was a little bit of reduction in the gross amounts. And the last piece is our exports has actually got reclassified into our subsidiary. So again, it starts to give you a flavor that both in our base business as well as in the nutrition business, there were a lot of elements which are unique to a quarter, or there are also some of them are structural. So now what I will therefore do is rather than trying to reconcile this at a line level, I will give you a bit of a flavor at a headline basis and, and the likely impact nutrition has on each of our lines. Uh, before I do that, to recap, our base business had lower EBITDA of 170 basis points. Nutrition gave us a positive 60, therefore making it about 110. Now, if I take some of the key elements to this, and the first one really being material cost, uh, on a reported basis, you would see that reported material costs are higher by about 234 basis points. Here we had a positive impact from nutrition. That means if we did not have nutrition added into the numbers, you would have seen a higher material cost when you compare it on a BIPS basis. When you look at the other operating income, on a reported basis, you'll see an improvement of 18 basis points. Here the nutrition bring, uh, business brings us a positive effect due to the service income related to the OTC portfolio. On reported employee costs, uh, you will see about 170 basis points, 117 basis points. Uh, when I look at it from a nutrition perspective, we took a lot of costs out from the nutrition business from an overage on a YOY basis. Therefore, that was beneficial there. But having said that, given that the employee costs are high in nutrition, it has an adverse impact on HUL. And when you look at BMI and other expenses, now this is a combination including nutrition. Uh, and, and as a percentage of turnover, this does not have a material difference. Yeah? So hopefully it gives you a bit of a picture to understand some of these moving numbers. It is indeed complicated. Uh, so it gives you a bit of a sense on that. What we're also doing is tomorrow, we will be setting up some time to actually give you a broader update on the nutrition business and to talk through some key elements in terms of the growth and the margin potential. In that context, therefore, if you now look at it, uh, I think this gives you a good sense in terms of growth as well as margins. Uh, I think the important point to call out, and I think it's Sanjeev made here, was really saying that if you look at it at segmental levels, our margins are actually very healthy. Home care at about 19%, beauty and personal care at about 28 and foods and refreshments at about 20 are, are, are really uh, demonstrate the sense of our business and of our financial model. Uh, this is a quick summary, therefore, in terms of the overall results. And, and I think we have covered most of these elements in fair amount of detail, including exceptional items, with which I started with. Uh, I think this is an important aspect. If you really look at it, our business operations are well-funded, and our financial model continues to be strong. Uh, if you remember, in 2016, we had, we had actually uh, formalized a scheme of arrangement for transferring the balance which was sitting in general reserves into the PNL account. 
Uh, this was approved by the shareholders, and subsequently we had obtained the approvals of the National Tribunal, NCLT, in, in 2018. Uh, immediately thereafter, we actually went into a GSK merger, which therefore meant that we could not have distributed these uh, reserves to the shareholders at particular point in time. With the merger now having been completed, our business operations being well-funded, our financial model continuing to be strong, and given our confidence in our overall business model, the board has actually approved the distribution of reserves to the shareholders by means of a special dividend of 9.5 rupees. This will entail a total payout of about 2,232 crores. And if I now come to my last slide, uh, I think it's really starting to give a perspective about looking ahead. The outbreak of COVID has disrupted the business massively in the short term. Yeah? And, and it is actually the road to new normal is likely to be uncertain. And Sanjeev spoke in detail about some of these aspects. In these unprecedented times, therefore, it is a little difficult to have a demand prognosis at this stage. What's clear is liquidity pressures remain elevated and there is volatility in costs. I think there's another important, there are two important dimensions I think which we need to you know, be, be cognizant of. The first is we are continuing to see many more lockdowns in the month of July. There are vertical lockdowns, localized lockdowns. This is indeed putting a lot of pressure on the operations. The second part I think with Sanjeev started by talking about was really the pipelines with reference to our distributors. In the month of March, we had lost a lot of our distributor pipeline, which we gained back in the month of June. But given the uncertainties, uh, I think what we should not do is to really take the June performance and extrapolate it going forward. Uh, I think the important aspect when you look ahead is to really focus on demand generation. And, and in this regard, I think we have the right portfolio and we have the right execution capabilities. And to that extent, I think HUL is positioned better than anyone else to really capture the opportunity in this market context. Our organizational strengths are very clearly articulated and you're well aware of. I think they will enable us to, to drive our model, which is really around future fit and purpose driven. And I think we will focus on really a competitive volume growth and really protect our financial model by looking at absolute profits as well as focusing on cash delivery. Yeah. So therefore, I think that gives you a bit of a flavor in terms of the overall performance uh, from a strategy perspective and the financial numbers. And now I'll hand it over to Amit for us to really begin our Q&A. Thank you, Sanjeev, and thank you, Srinivas. With this, we will now move to the Q&A section. In addition to the audio, as always, our participants will have an option to post questions through the web option on your screen. We will take up those questions just before we end. Before we get started with the session, I would like to remind you that the call and the Q&A session are only for institutional investors and analysts. And therefore, if there is anybody else who is neither an institutional investor or an analyst but would like to ask us a question or engage with us, please feel free to reach out to the investor relations team. With that, I would like to hand back to Ms. Stanford to manage the next session for us. Go ahead, uh, Stanford, over to you. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may please press star, then one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star, then two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who wishes to ask questions, please press star, then one. The first question is from the line of Manoj Menon from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, team. Uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, you know, a very, very comprehensive and a useful, uh, you know, couple of slides actually, importantly, which was very, I mean, it's a very good presentation. Um, I have four questions. I'll ask two and I'll come back later for the other two. Uh, the first piece, uh, you know, uh, understood that uh, some of the categories like hygiene, et cetera, now would have actually got a boost and possibly, uh, you know, there is a fundamental reshaping into the medium term. Uh, what I'll be interested to hear some thoughts from, uh, you know, Sanjeev and Srini would be on, let's say, uh, you know, any such similar opportunities exist for backside reconfiguration also. The example what I have in my mind is, let's say, something like a shampoo, 
you know, uh, you know, is, is, is this opportunity where consumers are buying large packs, etc.? I know that it's a bit of crystal ball gazing, but uh, you know, is there an opportunity to fundamentally reshape the pack size, which can have significant impact on the profit pools into the medium term? That's the question number one. Okay, so what you were talking about is whether there are opportunities like shampoo to uh, to basically scale up the reach and accessibility of new categories. You know, take sanitizer for instance. We have launched sanitizer in fashion, but uh, sanitizer during the peak of the pandemic. Of course, people are clamoring for it, and it's a new habit, and uh, it has uh, really, uh, you know, gone through the roof in terms of demand. But I don't think this demand will sustain once the vaccine comes into the market. Of course, it is not going to go back to the pre-COVID level. It will remain at a high level, but it will not be today. Today, I would believe it's at an obsessive level, right? Any surface you touch, you want to clean your hands after that. Any packet that comes from outside, you want to sanitize it and uh, use the sanitizer for uh, disinfecting your hands. So that is not going to remain at this heightened level, but certainly the practice of people carrying sanitizers, I believe, will remain. The big shift I would certainly see is in hand washing. You know, we have been investing huge sums of money over the years in cultivating the right behaviors for people. I think this market development work would have been done by pandemic, and people will certainly transform and realize that washing your hands with soap, which can cost you just 10 paise if you use a life boy, can do wonders for your health. So this is, again, something as a practice will remain. The other would be a shift towards liquid, I would believe. India has been very slow in adopting liquid. This will give a big fillip to it. The fourth would be the entire range of disinfectants. Yeah, lots of it cleaners, toilet cleaners, etc. There would be an heightened need. So these are the areas where clearly one should see the market developing and the habit sustaining. That would be my pitch. If, if I can add, Manoj, I think uh, you were referring to also here in trying to see if there was a big portfolio shift towards bigger bottles and therefore a better value creation or a better profit. Uh, I think two thoughts. One is if you see from a rural perspective, I think this is, this is important to understand India on a disaggregated basis. If you see rural, I think the focus still continues to be a lot more on sashes, entire two, prior three towns. Uh, wherever there is an income stress, I think that that still continues to be relevant. Having said that, we've also seen in some of the urban areas, large packs and large value consumption items have come into play. But, but it's an important aspect to see whether it was actually, you know, people buying in because there was a scarcity mindset or there is a fundamental shift to demand. So, so I think the important aspect is I think we have a very good sense of what's really happening in different parts of the country. At this stage, it's difficult to call whether we will see a big shift in those dynamics. Uh, I think Sanjeev explained well what is visible to us, uh, but we'll continue to keep an eye on some of these trends and, and to capture the value. Got it. Got it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The second question is on the uh, GSK uh, portfolio's uh, 5% growth in the quarter. I understand that uh, one dot doesn't really make a line, so it's just a very small sample size. Uh, the only context of asking this question is, uh, how do I think about this 5% number? Uh, you know, is it good, neutral, not so good, uh, you know, the way you're looking at it, actually. Uh, the reason I'm again asking is because, uh, you know, there was a great enabling environment, uh, you know, for this category in the last three months and possibly continues, uh, you know, as well. It's just a question of, uh, you know, uh, the immunity and those repositioning messaging probably happened in May and June, uh, you know, and the adult target audience, etc. So the thought process, what I'm trying to understand is, uh, you know, uh, is the tailwinds of the immunity plus the good for you, uh, you know, proposition of the product versus Horlicks or, or MSB actually discretionary within people sort of a headwind. Uh, how do you look at the next year? Uh, uh, you know, in this? That's a good question, Madhavaj. 
you know, our immediate task was to ensure that the baton did not fall. And from the numbers, you would realize that indeed it did not fall. The second big task for us is to grow the market. And we have started with pouch pack. We have started with uh, innovation. And you will see more about it as we grow about developing the market. I am very optimistic that this is a category which we have acquired at absolutely the right time. Okay, okay, yeah, sure. It would take some time if we are able to get the benefit of distribution, etc. Got it, got it. So this is really not an underlying, uh, you know, sort of situation. Okay, but just if I may, uh, you know, push a little bit on, what's your initial thoughts on this, uh, you know, the creature you can state to construct of this, uh, you know, business. I mean, without COVID, actually. What is the construct of the business? Yeah. No, what I'm maybe, maybe I'll ask this question tomorrow, Sanjeev. So I think you have the hot list in BSK day tomorrow. I'll come back actually in the queue so and ask this question tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abnish Roy from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Sir, uh, firstly, congrats for uh, good set of numbers in a very tough quarter. So, uh, last three, four years, uh, you have closed the portfolio gap uh, in a very good manner. The so premium hair oil, uh, nutrition, feminine hygiene, regional ice cream, etc. Uh, if you see last four months, the two categories which have seen one of the highest growth, uh, noodles and biscuits, your presence there is very notional, uh, either through own or through the acquisition. Uh, now, uh, Biscuits and Horlicks did not succeed even after multiple interventions. Uh, similarly, Connor noodles also you have tried a lot of stuff, but in most consumers' mindset, it is not there in the consideration set. It's the top two brands only. So what would be required here? Because uh, we are seeing definitely even IT companies are saying that four or five years down the line also, most employees for them and a lot of other sectors will remain work from home. So in that context, what is the strategy? Because these are very large categories. Biscuits, in fact, is the largest category. So what would be the strategy here? It will be mainly through the inorganic only. This is possible because you or GSK has tried earlier, but we haven't seen really any meaningful success. You know, I, Abneesh, first is not every company can be good at everything. Yeah, we have to accept that. And uh, biscuits is not a category where we have any heightened focus. And you're right that noodles we tried with it but i don't think we got to absolutely right big success i would still believe that we have a portfolio which to a large extent is uh, is recession resilient and uh, we should not get carried away by the inherent demand looking at one quarter yeah, we have a portfolio where our tea and coffee is on a great rhythm, our soups, our ketchup, they are on a fabulous rhythm. We have massive opportunity to grow our Horlicks business, yeah, which is the penetration is just at 25%. And then we have the entire portfolio of uh, you know cleaning and uh, uh, from a hygiene perspective, whether it is from a laundry perspective, whether it is from household cleaning, whether it is from skin cleansing. So we have a good, solid portfolio. So I remain very confident that we have a portfolio, not only good from a long-term perspective, and also from a medium-term perspective, a short-term perspective. Yeah, And let's not, you know, I can't believe that there's no person in the world who doesn't like to feel good and better. So let's not in any way feel that beauty doesn't have potential. There will be a massive bounce back of the beauty category. Right. Is there uh, one follow-up here? So this quarter, in fact, coming back to biscuits, uh, bread has done better than biscuits, in fact. Uh, so uh, have you seen in the adjacencies to bread, for example, jams and sauces, have you seen similar sharp pickup or is it the more modest pickup uh, similar yeah. to the overall food category? You know, jam, ketchup, they're growing at a very robust pace. And it is but natural. Where people are cocooned in homes, 
these categories, with kids all locked up in homes, there would be demand for these products. It is very natural that there would be a big burst of demand for these products. Uh, sir, my uh, second question. Yeah. 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 Of course. That's good. Yeah, my uh, second question is on the hygiene and sanitizer. You mentioned uh, a good point that after vaccination, uh, we would need to be realistic. Now you have scaled up uh, the capacity here by 100x. I I think it will be mostly outsourcing. Uh, my question is, if you see paint companies are entering here, liquor companies are entering, every personal home care company has entered here. So even after the vaccination, this will remain a much larger category than what it was in 2020, FY20. So, uh, how do you see the construct of the market share? Will it be similar to the deodorant wherein there's no uh, sticky market share for any player? It will be driven by trade spend and ad spend, or it will reflect no. uh, the personal wash kind of market share? Uh, what's I, your I sense? Would, I would believe it will be more like the personal wash market. Yeah, where there would be some brands with credibility on uh, hygiene, which will have a larger part of the market. And today, because of the pandemic and because of the heightened need, I think more the merrier. Let more players come in and let them grow the market. And so this 100x capacity is, is obviously outsourced, right? So that's not a problem. No, we have, uh, you know, first is there is outsourced. There is also internal. But our internal capacity is fluid. We can shift it between different liquids. And so one last one, uh, distributor pipeline, uh, you mentioned in June, there has been a uh, uh, benefit because of that. Is it possible to quantify that? You remember in the March quarter, we had said we had de-stocked by 6%. Yeah, so what we had stocked in the March quarter, we have upstocked in the June quarter. Oh, okay, sir, uh, that's all fun. Thanks so much. Uh, Thank one question for you, Abhish. Yeah. Yes, sir. What? Why have you decided to come down uh, in your batting order? <laughs> sir, I tried but couldn't succeed. Uh, <laughs> but, but number one also, now one down also is a great batting spot. You know that, no? <laughs> Thank you. The next question is from the line of Percy Pantaki from IIFL. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, good evening team and uh, congrats on a good set of numbers in the current uh, environment. Uh, sir, I'll uh, just start off where uh, Abnish left off in terms of the pipeline restoration. So last quarter you had mentioned that there is a total 12 percentage point swing because of pipeline, maybe 6% uh, distributor and 6% uh, retailer. So that 6% uh, 6 percentage points of distributor you are saying has been regained. Any idea on where we stand in terms of the six percentage points of uh, retailer pipeline? Have we regained any part of it or not? Yeah. You know, if you remember, what we had said is there is about a 12% out of which 6% is uh, uh, the impact of distributors. You know, the balance 6% we had said some is trade stock and some is underlying demand which would have gone off because of the shutdowns that have happened. Yeah, so you can safely assume that the estimate would be about three, four percent would be the trade stock. Trade stocks, it is very difficult to gauge at this stage because we are not getting our Nielsen data, and uh, a lot of stores remain closed during this period. Yeah, even towards the end of June, about 20 percent of the outlets which we were serving were closed. So I think you will have to wait for some more time to see whether the trade pipeline has completely filled up. Right. And, 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 and the uh, other aspect to add the Percy is, let's say even in the quarter, in certain categories such as ice cream, out-of-home consumption, it will be fair to assume that that's not going to come back because summer was a big season, let's say, from an ice cream's perspective, or let's yeah. say some of the food solutions which was supplying to, to restaurants. So some of those elements well, we've definitely lost. Yeah. And therefore, it will take us a bit more time to get a good handle on the total picture. Sure. Uh, and Shini, did you mention uh, during your initial comments that uh, the June uh, sales growth is somewhere in the region of mid-single digit? Yes, I did that. 
Okay, so would it be fair to sort of assume that uh, after accounting for the uh, pipeline refill, uh, the sort of uh, secondary sales growth is approximately flat in the month of June? Uh, don't have that number straight away, uh, but but definitely if I see from a quarter perspective, secondaries are lagging some of the primaries, and that's only natural yeah? because first you just get the distributor pipeline going, and then in due course you will start to see the secondaries. Sure. Uh, so a second question is on uh, gross margins. You did allude to it in your opening comments, so I'll not go into uh, too much details on the moving parts. But uh, as you said, uh, it's a 230 bips uh, contraction, and if I include uh, the GSK mix effect, it would be somewhere in the region of 350 to 400 bips on an organic basis. So just wanted to understand one, is there any COVID related costs in these which would uh, go away as the sort of COVID impact fade? And secondly, if there is no COVID related cost in the uh, in this line item, uh, then this such a big swing of 350 to 400 bips YOY, how much do you think is uh, sort of a very short term thing and how much do you think can really continue for a, a few quarters more? So, so let, let me split that up. They're, they're definitely COVID-related on cost. Yeah? Yeah, they're COVID-related on cost both in the materials line, for sure. They're also COVID-related costs in our conversion costs. Uh, and they're also COVID-related costs in some of the other expenses, yeah? just, just given the nature of what's happening. Some of that we, we hope to take it out because supply resilience has come back. But some of it is also something which is likely to continue on an ongoing basis because the overall uh, management of safety, PPE equipment, taking care of your outer core are, are, are inherently higher. Uh, I think the other important aspect is, is that we also had a, a, a big negative mix in the quarter. Uh, I think we had a negative mix because of the BPC uh, parts of the business, let's say the skin and some of the others uh, having muted or negative growth. Uh, we've also had, uh, given that we operated with a very tight SKU mix, which also meant that uh, it was attuned to what the consumers were buying. So we found adverse mix there. So, so I think it's difficult at this stage to put a pen on all of them, but, but going forward, we definitely expect some of the mix to improve, for sure. Uh, some of the COVID on cost, we hope will not be at the same intensity, but we'll have to see how the lockdowns will happen. And, and this is something I think we just need to be watchful, personally, that in the next couple of quarters, We'll have to be very dynamic with, with all of these things. Uh, and, and that's what we will do. Uh, I think important to get that volume growth construct going well. And if you get that going, I think, I think margin restoration is, is, is not going to be difficult. But again, having said that, we also start from very, very healthy margins. Yeah? While, while we'll all get to uh, no, do a lot of these BIPs calculations, why, oh, why, even if you look at it on a sequential basis, and if you really look at each of our divisions, uh, I think the margins are very, very healthy. Yeah, and last question, if I may, the core uh, hygiene categories, that is the hand wash and the hand sanitizer, and maybe include Domex uh, brand also, just these three. Uh, uh, I mean, some companies uh, have been uh, sort of saying that these core hygiene categories on our low base have grown like 3x or 4x also. So what is your experience? Could you like give some kind of uh, ballpark idea what percentage sales contribution do they have this quarter and what was it in the base quarter 12 months ago? So, so Percy, I don't think at this stage we are splitting all of this at, at that level. Uh, it suffices to say, for, for example, hand, hand wash, hand sanitizer, uh, SIF or, or Domex or WIM for that matter, have all actually registered very good growths. And I think the potential is immense. I think one is what has actually happened in the quarter, uh, where you're also reacting in some cases to demand, where you're leading demand in some cases. But, but I think there is a better picture. We will start to see in September quarter and December quarter, because some of these are actually going to be sustainable over the next six, nine months before there is a structural solution or, or, or a cure to the, to the pandemic. Right, sir. That's all from me. Thanks and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vivek Maheshwari from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Hi, good evening, everyone. Hi, Vivek. Uh, hi. Uh, my first question is: Last quarter there was quite a bit of debate about, you know, um, I know these are still early days, but to the extent you know you have intelligence on organized versus unorganized, and you know some reports talking about unorganized being more agile. 
and gaining share whereas your point was that you know it's ultimately the organized guys who will benefit and brands will be favored any updates since you know since the last time that we spoke on this issue yeah you know uh, vivek uh, uh, what uh, shrini indicated that we are gaining share in over 80% of attend and in many of this they are very handsome share so i wouldn't be worried about i think the important bit is is not about organizing and organize there are two things which stand out one is which is a company which is agile and can maneuver or manage the disturbances or handicaps that come on the way and the second also it is very clear that during these times people do gravitate towards trusted brands that would be my pitch to you sure sure and second i know there is a gsk uh, call plan tomorrow but this 5% growth what you mentioned is it possible just to be, given that you know april must have been a tough one any comment on the exit rate in in the month of june the so june is also actually started to pick up in in the same context i think that the degrees will vary yeah but when you compare from an april may and june point of view we have seen an improved trajectory but but again again vivek it's important not to as i have said that we, we shouldn't take june and start extrapolating because this this is a, a fairly uncertain environment and a fairly volatile environment given the supply chain constraints that we are having having said that the momentum has been positive as the months have progressed and and that will remain our objective to see how do we continue to have and have that going sure okay and she one another thing the others uh, just a bookkeeping one uh, others uh, in segmental this 49 crores ebit what does that number represent uh, amit can you just clarify that please if you can you wanted to understand what is the other segment right uh, vivek right i mean from a run rate of let's say plus minus 2 crores that number has jumped up to 50 crores so is yeah. it gsk bai or Uh, you know, yeah. can you just so, clarify so, what is the quantum yeah, yeah. is this given so, the quantum sure sure so first of all uh, what compromise of uh, of the other segment that is important to understand then obviously ebit is a follow through of that so traditionally our exports business is how, uh, whatever we sell uh, related to exports is housed there now in addition to that we are also exporting uh, the gsk portfolio right so we will send it to our captive subsidiary and then that exports it out so that is one business which is housed there and also the gsk otc oh business is housed there so these are the three primary things which comprise of the which comprise of the other segment and hence the margins related to these three businesses are reflected in the ebit margins of others got it that is useful and lastly sanjeev is it possible since you know we are, we are speaking now is it possible if you can give some you know your views about glow and lovely and uh, the fact that can this create a bit of a disturbance in the transitioning phase yeah uh, i'm glad the way you raised that uh, you know why i'll say is i'm very confident about glow and lovely uh, you know first important bit is that this is a work which has been uh, on for the last few years yeah i'll recap the bit of the history the second is we first in the communication then after a lot of research we went in for a major relaunch last year when we changed the proposition and went away from fairness to hd glow and since the relaunch our penetration and market share in two have been unprecedented which gave us immense confidence that the last lap was to move towards changing the name so i am very confident that glow and lovely will not only take with it the franchise and the consumer base of fair and lovely but it will also add consumers who hither to who are not with fair and lovely that's my uh, uh very clear feeling Uh, based on the work that has been done, the results that we have achieved, and the plans that we have put together, yeah, but it's a big relaunch, and uh, let's see the results. I'm very confident. Right, right. 
thank you and wishing you and the team all the very best thank you thank you the next question is from the line of arnab mitra from credit suisse please go ahead yeah hi good evening uh, uh given the uh, you know big in- income effect on consumers uh, and now it's been 3 4 months uh, into the situation um, are you seeing uh, the lower or the mass end of the portfolio for you in many categories uh, either growing faster than the overall category growth or uh, actually the gap between that growth and the premium growth narrowing and is is it like a broad based trend or is it specific to certain categories if you could throw a bit of light on that you know i'll give you some structural answer because as yet we don't have all the information first is yes the frequency of purchases has gone up so there are more trips to the grocers now second is we are seeing many consumers gravitate towards low price point packs yeah that's also a very clear phenomenon is uh, from a perspective of moving to lower price brands that is yet to become completely discerning in some pockets we see it but it's not a very big trend as yet that uh, that is at this stage but if the economy continues at this pace and if it doesn't pick up then it could become more discerning and from our perspective the critical bit is that in most of the categories we have the brand or the portfolio to straddle the price benefit for it yeah so if there is a move then we have a brand like whether you look at laundry whether you look at skin cleansing whether you look at hair whether you look at tea we have the brand which can cater to the consumer uh, so we have to be a bit more watchful to see how trends shape up but we are keeping a very close watch on it sure thanks that's helpful and uh, the second question was you know shrini specifically mentioned three commodities uh, snp tea and wedge oils where you had inflation uh so my question was that one uh, are the trends currently improving in terms of the commodity costs going down or up and secondly any thoughts on pricing in some of these categories uh, in the current macro environment yeah, i'll do the picture yeah i'll i'll do that sanjeev and uh, the picture varies uh, on uh, clearly when you see tea tea is actually a new crop coming through uh, given given that there was scarcity in the month of the early season we have seen significant inflation come through in tea and also bit broad based not only from the premiums point of view so i think that's something which is playing out a uh, second if you really see from something like an smp uh, clearly going forward we have seen a lot of softening in the prices of smp given where they were earlier and some time back so i think that augurs as well from a category point of view if you look at veg oils and again it's an year on year uh, we had seen a big dip last year and subsequently we had seen increases Uh, so to that extent i think we have seen an increase in veg oils and 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 the trend is slightly upwards as as we speak uh, but again this is a situation which continues to be a bit dynamic given some of the international developments and and a read on demand and supply uh specifically in the question with regard to pricing and how we are approaching this uh in tea we are taking some judicious price increases in parts of our portfolio some of it has already landed and some of it will land in due course Uh, because the quantum of inflation there is 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 a lot uh, and also we'll do it on parts of the portfolio where it makes sense uh, when we look at from a home care or a laundry point of view uh, while while crude has picked up on a on a yoy basis uh, crude is much lower and 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 there we are actually looking to pass uh, some benefits to the consumers by reducing prices and and parts of it will now start to land uh, so that that's uh, that's the case of where we are actually looking at price reductions uh sure that's very clear and just one last question if i may uh, which is on the soap portfolio so this is one category where you had been losing market share relatively doing uh, worse than the industry in the last couple of years uh, now have you seen uh, while your growths are very good uh, any sense on have you been able to turn the needle on market share significantly uh, uh, given that lifeboy is one of the few uh, germ protection uh, equity brands and and any sense on market share movement uh, in that category we have started gaining volume shares 
in uh, the entire uh, skin cleansing portfolio, soaps as well as liquid. And I do hope, Anna, you also use life for Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> thank, so, thanks so much. Uh, all the best. Thank, thank you. you. The next question is from the line of Latika Chopra from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, good to see your resilient performance in the current macro. Uh, just uh, one uh, bit from my side. Uh, you did mention that, uh, you know, you saw rural uh, growing slightly better than urban. Uh, but given the uh, localized lockdowns that you're seeing now, do you see, uh, you know, this could challenge or put at risk the more resilient small town rural performance? Uh, and the second part is uh, on uh, on distribution channels. Uh, uh, as you exited June, it seemed that skincare uh, you mentioned you've started to see uh, green shoots emerging. How have the channel behavior on modern trade and e-commerce uh, uh, panned out for you? Yeah. Okay. First, hi, Latika. Good to have you on the call. You know, the rural and the small town, but to a large extent, depend on whether the infection spreads. You know, the first, the focus in the initial period has been on some of the big cities like Mumbai, Delhi, and Ahmedabad, Pune, where the infection rates were very high. As you see, settling it down over here, now they're spreading to tier two, tier three towns. So what you ask would really depend on whether we can contain the infection rate or it does spread and difficult to visualize what would be and to what extent and for what period would there be vertical lockdown. Yeah, I hope not, because uh, it would be sad when you're seeing some rural pickup that uh, we should not further see a constriction of the economy because of physical lockdown. I hope not, but we'll have to wait and see. And uh, uh, your second question, Latika, uh, uh, please, if you could, uh, again, uh, just channel, repeat that. On the channels constant. On you. the channels. Yeah, and yeah. how are we saying modern yeah. trade e-commerce? Yeah, there are two channels which have stood out during this period. One is e-commerce, albeit from a small base. The second is the humble grocer. Yeah, this two have done very well. Humble grocer for the proximity and e-commerce for the reasons we all and modern trade has suffered because the stores were shut. While they have tried to pivot towards only channel, they've not been able to pick up to the same extent as the stores that were closed down. And uh, so for us, the bigger impact of the modern trade stores not opening has been less in skincare, but more on categories like uh, color cosmetics where uh, large quantum of sales used to go through beauty stores and through modern trade stores where we have beauty counters. All right, uh, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Tejas Shah from Spark Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Sanjeev, uh, in uh, FY20, uh, uh, you were the first to actually call out deceleration in rural demand. Uh, but in recent months, the noise of rural revival is getting much more secular and way across uh, across uh, sectors now. So, just wanted to hear your current uh, read on the rural demand and is it is it sustainable in your opinion? Yeah. So, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, you know, till the crisis hit us, till say February. Uh, we were still seeing rural being soft. It had not that the rural had picked up. And it is only in recent term, times after the crisis that we have seen that a uh, lot of noise. And we must accept that the noise has been because one, the harvest has been put. So you are clearly seeing an uptick in uh, sales of categories like tractors and mobiles. And the second is government's proactive intention. Yeah? yeah, we were in fact clamoring that the Manrega rates and the Manrega outlay should have gone up in the last budget. But uh, nevertheless, they have gone up, which is absolutely right. The direct transfer also during this period has been right. So in the last, like I said, uh, 
we have seen that the growth rate of rural has been uh, not less than the urban growth rate. But then you also look at it from another lens that urban has been impacted uh, much more by the physical lockdowns and the closure of modern trade stores. And the economic activity in urban areas completely hampered because of uh, people staying at home and small and medium stores, uh, self-employed people, their earnings and all have been impacted. So I would not uh, say with certainty that the rural economy has picked up on a sustained fashion and is on a path to recovery. I would say there are clear green shoots, but let us wait for a couple of more quarters to see whether the trend becomes more discerning. Sure. So just a follow up on that. So last analyst presentation, you had shared this data that we are uh, 1.3 times over indexed in premium portfolio versus uh, rest of the market. So yeah. is it that we will be last or, or one of the, I would say uh, later on uh, people to fear, to, to experience that revival in rural because of much more premium end of the portfolio exposure that we have? No, it is this way. I'm glad. Again, it's a very good question. You know, you have to accept that in India, is not one India. You have about 10% of the household whose purchasing power would be comparable to the developed world. And for them, the premium that we talk about is not prestige premium. It's just a relative premium. And they would never give up the benefit of higher order benefits coming from slightly more expensive brands because of the value that we create. So they won't be impacted. And then what we have done that in, uh, uh, for uh, uh, people who cannot afford, we have also made our premium brands accessible to them through lower price point packs. Yeah. So that's the story. But if times become tough, then you would like to even ration your outlay on even these products and may go in for a lower unit price packs, but which will give you more ML or more grams. Yeah. So that could happen, but we have a portfolio which will cater to it. And also we must remember for instance, that the bottle consumers are very different from sachet consumers. If you're used to using a bottle of shampoo, you will not very easily move towards sachet. Yeah, sure. you will stay to bottles. So that is the reason we always say that the FMCG categories in which we operate are recession resistant. They're not recession proof, but they are definitely resistant. Sure. And uh, last question, uh, Sunil, so this calendar year has been very remarkable on, on other count also that the first half itself, uh, we, have, we are seeing many deep pocketed global and, and even national giants are uh, trying to disturb the GT channel or, or rather reinvent the GT channel by uh, owing Kiranas to dial up on digital network. Now, amidst this change, where do we see our role considering that we have brands also and we have our own digital distribution ambitions as well? So where do we position ourselves in this? First is, I firmly believe that bringing in technology and the science of retailing is the right thing for the country and for the channel. Yeah, we want the GT channel to survive and thrive because 100 million lives, they get dinner on the table because of this channel. So it's very important for us. Now, we our strength is, because we are the trustworthy partners of this channel, over decades, and we have great relationships. And uh, we are also bringing in technology to them. By, I've, talk, I've spoken about Shekhar. Even the back end, we have completely in many cases, we are reinventing the business model so that we can serve them with speed. And then we have also brought in initiatives like MyKirana, which will give them the benefit of e-commerce, 
without significantly changing the business model. Yeah. So we are extremely happy with technology being brought in. We will partner with uh, companies so that we can help the grocery channel to survive and thrive. Thanks. Uh, that's all for my side. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sharish Pardeshi from Centrum. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Good evening, and thanks for the opportunity, and congratulations for a good set of numbers. Uh, my two questions uh, relate. Uh, one is on the uh, category growth. Uh, if I say, uh, and if I understand correctly, you said on the core portfolio, excluding GSK, our revenue decline was seven percent, and uh, volume decline was eight percent. So, would you be able to give uh, the, uh, including GSK, what would be the volume uh, number? Shini, do you want to abandon that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so look, uh, we, we've said, look, the point is the GSK is, there is no base comparator because the whole business comes into effect from 1st of uh, April. Uh, we and, and therefore the five percent growth that we have given you in a manner is is got combination of volume and uh, price, so it's a positive on both. So the picture gets a little better, but but at an aggregate, if you see the GSK portfolio is less than ten percent of the totality. So if you want to do on a comparable basis, the picture may not be very very different. Yeah? So what I was trying to understand is we have three segments uh, that eight percent decline. Which segment has shown the sharpest? I mean, I would assume uh, beauty and personal care would be there, but uh, course, if you can spread. It, it, yeah. it is quite natural, and I think with, with beauty and personal care indeed is a big component. Within that, you will have the skin coming as a clear component because we also talked about we couldn't supply in the initial parts, and, and it started only later on. Uh, we talked about ice creams, and if you really looked at some of the, the drops that we've had in ice creams and what we called in the discretionary, 5% of the business went down by about 69, 15% of the business went down by about 45%. So there are large components sitting there as well. Yeah. So And, and remember, we keep talking about UVG. It's not absolute volumes. So it's a combination of volume and mix. So so that both of them come into play uh, to, to have an impact. I do understand. Yeah. And my last question, uh, on the uh, new product uh, launches, uh, Somewhere I gathered we have significantly launched about 40, 50 new products. So if you can elaborate what kind of uh, segmental opportunity in health and hygiene or what are the categories we are now trying to get into uh, in the market? And if you can say what is the new product contribution in quarter? You know, first is I just want to clarify to you so that you get a better perspective of the business. You know, Srini also alluded to that 80% of the portfolio was growing at 6%. Yeah, and uh, yeah. so that means the bigger impact. So don't look at it from a length of division. Look at it from the three buckets that we spoke about. The first is the uh, categories which will still remain relevant during this time. Then there is, on the other extreme, 5%, which are mainly out of home, where it is not that ice cream has not become relevant, but people don't have access because they don't go out. Similarly, USS, because we, the restaurants are closed. Yeah, And then there is the categories which are a bit more discretionary in nature and which were impacted by supplies. So look at it with that lens. It will give you a better picture rather than looking at it from a division lens for this purpose. I got it. Thanks, Sanjeev. Yeah. But uh, my question was on the new products. Uh, what yeah. we are now launching. New product. It, it's still too early to give you what is the impact uh, it will have. But where our main focus has been, like we said, on nutrition. We went in with uh, new packs. We went in with uh, added link for families. Similarly, we are looking at domestos. Yeah, we have come out with a spray where you can uh, kill the virus within 60 seconds. Then we have gone in for Lifebuoy on the detergent side. Yeah, then we have just launched a wind bar with, again, bacteria kill properties. So our entire focus has been the initial space, all the products that we have launched, a lot of sanitizers, Lifebuoy sprays, 
sanitizers in different formats for institutions, right up to the fashion. So when we talked about the 50 products, there were brands, variants, and pack size combinations. And uh, the real benefit of these would be as we go along, because many of them were uh, launched during the latter part of the quarter. In the first uh, month in April, we were battling to restart the operations while our innovation teams were working on it. But most of them were brought in towards the latter half of June. Okay. All right. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sanjay Manial from ICACA Direct. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, the, uh, most of my uh, questions uh, have been answered. Just uh, probably if you can elaborate some uh, key prices. Uh, uh, what I understand, probably key prices are almost 40 50% up uh, uh, on a year on year basis. And uh, uh, what probably the price hikes they have taken is uh, uh, what I understand is probably uh, in a single. Uh, the cross margins would impact forward. Excuse me, uh, this is the operator. I'm sorry to yeah. stop. Mr. Manier, your voice is breaking. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, Sanjay, go ahead. Go ahead. We can hear you. Yeah, so my question specifically on the T prices, uh, uh, that uh, T prices are uh, almost 40 to 50% up year on year yeah. basis, and probably the price hikes you have taken is uh, uh, still would be on single digit, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and uh, how it would impact the gross margins, board, and what would have been the impact on gross margins in this quarter? Uh, and will you be able to really uh, fill the gap if the price is sustained for the entire year? So, so two or three things. So, so you're right that the inflation is tending to be quite high, and and uh, it's important how the crop comes through between July and and going forward, because effectively June was the first month where you start to see sizable crop coming through. And inflation has been significant. Uh, I think we have a simple playbook and a well-tested playbook in this for, for many, many years. Uh, when you see this kind of inflation, you always need to be calibrated in terms of how you take up pricing. Uh, you will take uh, price increases in smaller quantities. And, and if required, you will do that at a certain frequency. You, you would never try and take up prices at a big clip because that's when you start to lose consumers. Uh, as far as gross margins are concerned, uh, yes, and, and we have said that we have multiple levers to manage the overall P&L. While gross margin is important and is reflective of the long-term health of the business, uh, when you see this kind of inflation, uh, I think you would rather manage your overall P&L at, at, a, at a YOM level or a net profit level. And, and it's also important that we can manage it at a portfolio level and also at an HUM yeah. level. I think I think if we do that sensibly, and then again, we, we also have many levers in terms of our savings agenda, our, our leverage in terms of what we drive. So so many of them will come into play to enable us to manage this sensibly. Because if you do it well, actually, when and in categories such as the inflation is a good thing, and and it gives us an opportunity for us to gain both on a volume basis as well as on a value basis. We have seen some inflation in the quarter, especially in the month of June. But, but at an aggregate level, you've seen that our FNR margins are overall extremely healthy, and, and therefore that's not been a big impact for us in June quarter. Uh, right. Uh, just uh, one uh, bit more, to, uh, if you can uh, uh, you know, quantify the distributor pipeline uh, by the end of, uh, at the end of uh, June quarter. I think Sanjeev already spoke about that. We had lost about 6 odd percent in March quarter. We have gained that distribution pipeline back. Yeah? That, that's, that's really the headline I'm saying. Okay. Uh, and it's just, just one last one. Uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, there, there would have been supply disruption probably uh, starting uh, July. Uh, and uh, one of your plants in Haridwar has probably shut down now. Uh, so is there any other plant which has also uh, been shut down because of the lockdown? Or what could have been the, uh, you know, supply disruption in terms of the uh, capacity? Yeah, you know, we have, would you want to share it? Yeah, we have over 30 plants. And then we have many 2PT and 3P plants dedicated to us. Right now, there are three plants where we have factories which we have to shut down because of rising cases of infection. And, uh, yeah, there is pipeline stock. So we are confident 
that we will be able to restart this operation soon. And then also remember that it is not that we have 100% capacity utilization everywhere, and uh, we shift capacity if need be. And I am very confident that all the three facilities will be we will be able to restart soon. Uh, okay. Actually, if you if you if you ask uh, in my my view, I think right now what we are experiencing is difficulty in distribution because of localized lockdowns. It's not a manufacturing constraint. We have the stocks. Uh, it's just that many parts of the country are going into lockdowns of different uh, degrees and different timelines, and that's actually restricting a lot of movements of goods. Uh, I think that is a bigger concern for now, and not manufacturing. Manufacturing, I think Sanjeev has explained clearly where we stand. Thank you, and all the best for the future. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Aditya Soman from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, just following up on a previous uh, reply, uh, uh, in terms of distribution, uh, has the rural distribution got uh, impacted in the previous quarter, and has it normalized again? Uh, I'm assuming that we would have prioritized some amount of urban distribution uh, given uh, a potentially higher value in urban. Sorry, what uh, was the question is how is what's the status of our distribution uh, in rural and urban and uh, and Aditya was wondering whether if we have prioritized uh, urban distribution versus versus rural. No, it is not that we are uh, prioritizing urban over uh, rural. You know, our object we are a national company and we have big rural footprints, so we would like to distribute our goods as far as possible and as wide as possible. You know, we get con sometimes constricted by the restrictions, but as far as priority is concerned, we would reach wherever our consumers are, and our consumers are national. Yeah. And, and again, to give you a flavor, our Shakti channel, which is an important deep rural channel, is actually quite resilient and working quite well. Uh, so I think it also gives you a flavor saying that it's important. We are national and all channels are relevant. And, and Shakti is a good example of how rural distribution is still continuing to work well for us. Fair enough, thank you. Uh, and secondly, you mentioned uh, sort of mixed deterioration overall, um, and part of it coming because uh, sort of the higher uh, value segments like uh, skin grew slower. But did you see any uh, improvement in tax size or increase in tax size in home care, given that uh, consumers were less certain about uh, availability? Can I say that again? I couldn't. Yeah, uh, just given that consumers were less certain about availability for detergents uh, in, in April and May, was there, was there any increase in tax sizes in uh, detergents or in home care? Okay, okay. See, what we were doing is when there was significant supply constraint and we were having only a few factories running, then our focus was primarily on large packs. Yeah, because we were trying to maximize the throughput. But as things started to stabilize, then we went across the pack. In the initial period, the entire pitch was, how do you maximize? And the only way you would be by having larger packs. Fair enough. And so there was no sort of uh, significant mix improvement uh, that you would call out, say, in home care, uh, compared with a sort of mixed deterioration overall. Again, very difficult to say because, you know, this June quarter has been a quarter where we have filled up the pipeline. There has been uh, various kind of uh, supply disruptions. We don't even know whether the trade pipeline has been filled in or whether the trade stocks have come down. So very difficult to discern a trend, whether what is happening for a pack size movement. But some of the things which is not based on quantitative research but it is based more on qualitative. Like I said, is the number of shopper trips have increased. That means they are buying at more frequency. That would also mean that they are conscious about the outlay in the trade trips. And then the second is we are seeing a shift happening to a small pack. 
fair enough. No, very clear. And just lastly, on a housekeeping question, in terms of the uh, sort of uh, uh, higher decline in sales relative to volume growth, was this because of, uh, 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 sorry, a lower decline of sales relative to volume growth, uh, was this because of price increases that you took, uh, maybe in P in the previous quarter? No, so it's not about price increases. So we had also looked at a lot of rationalization of our trade spends, yeah? so, and, and that actually helps us from a point of view of positive pricing. So it's, it's not really a lot of pricing. There hardly, I don't think there was much of price increase per se in, in the quarter. From a consumer level. Yeah, not very good. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kunal Vora from BNB Paribas. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, first question, like in your presentation, you mentioned that we're still operating at only half the pre-COVID SKU. And you mentioned that in June, sales are already back to growth trajectory. Uh, can you help us understand better? Are all these SKUs which you are not currently producing insignificant in terms of contribution or consumers are buying whatever SKU is available? Like, uh, and uh, the 20% SQs which you are looking to permanently cut, uh, uh, will they be completely insignificant in terms of sales or uh, you think uh, consumers will move to the uh, alternative packs? Yeah, yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, in your question, there is an answer. Is in SMCG, there is always a very long tail. Yeah, and at periodic intervals, we do take a call to prune the tail. And we thought this is a great moment for us to prune the tail. And uh, during the period, like I was explaining to the previous person, that uh, when you have capacity constraints, when you have physical constraints, then the best is to maximize your throughput. So we got in those 50% of the SKU where the throughput is maximum. And you're absolutely right also in the thinking when during times when your distributions are constrained, then consumers would go for a brand, but if they don't get their pack size, they would get they would go for the pack size nearest to the old pack size. Formula goes with variance. And when we look at pruning, we are not looking at losing any sales. We are looking at consumers, which is a small portion of the sales because the tail is long, migrating to the other packs within the brand repertoire. Sure, that's helpful. The second and last one, uh, which involves CAPEX and tax rate. Like, you recently set up a new wholly owned subsidiary. Can you talk about the aggregate CAPEX plan and the investment plan in the newly set up subsidiary? And how would both of these, uh, like say, the new subsidiary as well as GSK acquisition, impact your tax rate in the near term and the medium term? So I think, look, uh, the new subsidiary is just taking shape and, and it will be some time before we actually set up some of those facilities and start to see production come through. So I think there will be some good 6, 9, 12 months away from that. So, so if I take the next 12 months horizon, I don't think that's going to be a big change. On, on GSK, I think we also mentioned last time that at an ETR, it's not going to make uh, make any difference because it's going to be a move between current tax and deferred tax. And, and we will talk about it tomorrow when we give an update on GSK. Uh, for I think all practical purposes, I think it would be good to assume around 26% as an ETR uh, for our business and, and operate with that over the next one year horizon. And that's it from my side, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can, can we do one last question from the phone because we have a few on the web and, and we want to make sure that we wind up the call by eight o'clock before eight o'clock please. Sure. Sir. We take the next question from the line of Prasad Deshmukh from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, good evening. Uh, so, first question: uh, Post lockdown, uh, are there any accelerated efforts to negotiate contracts uh, like those related to depots, uh, support services, leases, etc.? Especially given your focus on zero-based budgeting. You know, look. This. Sorry, go on. Go on. No, no, go no, no, ahead. Go ahead. No, uh, you know, our focus has been right now that any cost which doesn't add value, we are questioning it. And other what we are looking at is more about moving costs from fixed to variable so that we create optionality. Okay. You may want to uh, 
No, no, I, I think that's a fair summary. We do look at opportunities and uh, and we, we use the scale, we use our capabilities. But equally, we also honor contracts. Yeah? And I think it's an important to get that balance right. Uh, I think there is a piece of hard negotiation, but there is also a, a, a hard fact of first principles. And I think I think we do it within that balance. And I think the bigger opportunity is also to look at many costs which are fixed in nature and try and link them to sales and link them to growth. And, and I think if you do that, you then create structural solutions because some of these negotiations tend to be transitionary, uh, tend to give you short-term impact. But if you're able to get your focus in terms of making some of these costs variable, and, and that's a sustainable solution. I, I think between the two, I think our, our focus is really in getting some of these costs to be more variable. Got it. Uh, second last question, uh, advertising costs, uh, you mentioned that, you know, uh, there is some efficiency being driven there. So just wanted to confirm, uh, this decline is uh, mainly because the ad, the unit for ad space has gone down and it's not that there is any lower number of ads that were, that were uh, yet. Just wanted to confirm. So, so look, in the month of April, when then the lot of product itself was not available given constraints of supply, uh, it did not make a lot of sense in actually advertising. Yeah? And, and therefore, we did reduce our absolute spends in the month of April. And, and that is true of us and that is true of many others and the overall industry. Second aspect is also, but as the demand started, as the country started to open up, we did step up our spends. So, so May was more than April and June was higher than May. It's important to invest behind your brands. We did that. The other element also in all of this, given our scale and size, we have enjoyed some benefits of, of a good buying. That's also flown in. I think the most important criteria, because I think after a point in time, it's not the absolute spends, it's real relative spends on where you are. Uh, we, have, we have done everything to get to our reach and, and, reach and uh, objectives. More importantly, our share of spends in June quarter has been competitive. And actually, if you see our share of spend, which is relation to the market in June quarter 20 was higher than where it was a year ago. So therefore, we were spending more than our, our relative shares and reaching our consumers. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Thanks, Rivi. Uh, thanks, Rivi. Thank you. So you may go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so, so what I will do is uh, there are about six or eight or nine questions on, on the web. I will call out the name and the question and give a short answer. And if it's already been answered, I will clarify that. Uh, the first question is from Anshul Bharga from AB Corp, asking how much of price hike contributes to profits. Uh, I, I clarified this. There was no material price increases during the quarter. And, and therefore, there is nothing really in terms of a specific call out there. Uh, there's a question from uh, Bala Murali. Uh, wanting to know about the outlook of the industry and the growth prospects for HUL. Uh, I think we've covered this in detail, uh, also giving how we see the near term. Uh, so I trust this has really been answered. Uh, Vikas has got a question of saying he wanted to check the quarterly results. Please do so. It's available on our website. And hopefully in this call, you've got all the details. Uh, Meher has got a comment of earnings and special dividends. Not entirely clear, but we have, we have uh, talked in detail about both earnings and the strategic rationale for the special dividend. Uh, hopefully, Mihir, you have your answers. Uh, Vikas uh, Maheshwari is asked as an individual investor. Ideally, I, I wouldn't answer because there's a call for institutions. Uh, but I, I think I will give a little a quick answer to it. A share of Horlix, and I think if you really look at uh, the reported published results, you'll realize that uh, GSKCH was about 10% of our overall business. And we have spoken in detail about duty segment advertising and the performance in July. So that's already been covered. Uh, Rohit has asked about a question about would uh, what would growth be including distribution and ex exports business? Uh, I think so the question is we, we wouldn't really talk about the OTC income. It's always another operating income, and I wouldn't really talk about it from a growth perspective. Uh, I think the important aspect there is the net margins are protected. Uh, on the exports business, I think we have had a muted growth. Uh, that's more because of transitionary issues. Uh, I think the first objective was for us was to really manage the domestic business, and that's been done well. 
uh, we and, and there was in, in anticipation of the transition, there was some stock buildup which had already happened in the exports customers. And uh, therefore, and, and that was also an important thing to do, not to disrupt during the transition. We will now be focusing on the exports business to really streamline. And, and the structural opportunity of what it means is, is completely intact there. Yeah, hopefully that gives you a bit of a flavor, Rohit, in terms of uh, distribution as well as exports business. A uh, question from Akash Rumta on our guidance on volumes. Uh, Akash, we don't give any guidance on volumes, and, and we've been consistent with that. Uh, the next question is from Jayesh Shah. Uh, do we expect EV spends to settle down at a lower level? Uh, look, I think this is an evolving picture. TV still continues to be a very important medium, uh, especially if you go into beyond the top metros. And even within the top metros, uh, there is a certain select audience who's very, you know, dedicated to TV. And and our actual spends will follow wherever consumers are. And, and, and TV does tend to have a very important role. And, and therefore, we will continue to advertise them. Uh, Alok Shah from Edelweiss has asked a question. Our website says that Fair and Lovely has not been changed to Glow and Lovely. Uh, by when is the relaunch under Glow and Lovely uh, expected? Uh, we shall have it very soon. We have already commenced production of, of Glow and Handsome, and others will follow very, very quickly. Uh, and I think Sanjeev has spoken about the strategic rationale and how we see that coming into the quarter. Uh, there was a second question saying with respect to the special dividend. Uh, it, the 22 billion actually belong to the erstwhile shareholders, and why partake it with GSK shareholders? Uh, I, th I think it's important, Alok, to go back and look at the merger because the merger, when we did the swap ratio, took into account all the aspects of the balance sheet of both the companies. If I were to use your analogy, and I don't think that would be right, we've also had access to the cash from GSK, which was over 4,000 crores. Uh, we, we also had the benefit of, you know, their payouts used to be lower from a dividend perspective. Uh, I think the best way to look at it is that it's an integrated one company done on a share swap, and, and that actually, from a valuation perspective, evens out everything. Uh, the next question is from Raja Mohan. Uh, so there's congratulations on a solid quarter. Thank you for that. And, and the question is, God forbid if the virus were to spread more rapidly into tire and tire three areas, uh, would it lead to a material repression or are tailwinds of Kharif very strong to overwhelm this concern? In this regard, the tailwind otherwise strong enough to give an impetus to your performance. Uh, I think it will be a difficult one to call in terms of what kind of virus spread are we looking at uh, because that's, I think, the big unknown. But, but from a portfolio perspective, from our execution capabilities point of view, uh, I think we have given you a, a good flavor of how well we are positioned. Uh, I think the spread of virus and the consequent lockdowns, vertical or localized, uh, is going to be something very difficult for us to predict, and, and we'll have to, to handle it uh, with agility and, and be very responsive in the value chain. Uh, the next question is from Ajay Thakur from, uh, from Alda Capital, uh, asking us if you could throw some light on the urban versus rural growth and outlook for rural momentum. Is the spread of COVID into hinterland a risk to a rural growth momentum? Uh, Ajay, this has been discussed in the call, and, and we have actually answered this. So, so hopefully you would have already got that response. Uh, Sirish has had a question in terms of uh, uh, hand wash penetration and, and January, and are we witnessing a big opportunity in rural going forward? Uh, Sirish, we, we do not quote specific penetration numbers, but, but definitely there has been a step up to penetration. And, and that's also the reason you see that we have also expanded capacities by 5x in case of hand wash and about 100x in terms of hand, hand sanitizers. Uh, even into the rural areas, we do see hand wash being an opportunity because I think the awareness of hand wash and hand sanitizers actually has taken off in a big manner. Whether it is uh, whether it is urban areas or rural areas. Uh, the next question from Amit is is really in terms of is it possible to quantify the price cuts that you're planning to take in in laundry to pass on the crude deflation? Uh, Amit, I, I think this is a bit of work in progress. Uh, uh, we are continuing to work through this, and and it'll land in phases. Some parts have happened, and and more to follow. Uh, the next question has come from Richard. Uh, Richard said, can you help me understand the monthly progression of skin cosmetics in Dio? 
uh, how does that uh, how does that minus 45 break up into april and may and june uh, given that april june also had manufacturing issues on manufacturing etc uh, richard we are not breaking it up at, at this particular point in time i am not sure it entirely serves the purpose uh, having said that I, I did talk about skin starting to see green shoots and traction so obviously once we had some of those uh, supply issues sorted out skin has definitely picked up in the month of may and june cosmetics and deodorants has been challenging i, I think one aspect has really been in terms of manufacturing but the demand there also has been muted given given that a lot of consumers have remained in house so i don't think there will be a material pickup that we would see in terms of cosmetics and deo uh, with the progress of the months uh, the next question is from Tejal, uh, Tejas from, from Spark Capital on guidance on tax rates. Uh, I think I've already clarified that earlier in the call. Uh, the next question is also from Tejas. Any COVID cost saving initiatives which still uh, which stay with us as structural advantage? Any, any thoughts on room for margin potential ahead? I think we have discussed this in detail, Tejas. I think the important aspect right now is to get uh, competitive volume led growth. Uh, look at absolute profits and manage cash and um, excuse me this is the operator participants the line for mr srinivas patak has dropped please stay connected while we reconnect mr patak mr patak is reconnected uh, yeah i'm back yeah i'm sorry i'm back yeah sorry i lost the line there uh, so, so I've talked about the business model stages. Hopefully, that's answered your question. Uh, the next question is from Vishal uh, from Nirmal Bank. What is the current direct reach for us, and was it impacted in the March-April period? Uh, other income for the quarter looks low. Any exceptionals here? Uh, I, I think on the first part, I think yes, the direct reach was impacted in the month of March and April. Uh, but definitely it's picked up for us from the month of May, June, and it's getting better as we speak. Uh, I think we already spoke about the other income earlier in the call. And, and if you have any specific questions, do reach out to uh, Amit and our, in, our, and our IR team, and they will clarify on that one. Uh, the next question is, uh, would you like to comment on the lawsuit with Imami? I, I don't think we comment on, on a competition. Uh, I think our position is very clear, and, and you would have also seen some of the statements from HUL. Uh, and, and we are very clear, and we are progressing with our actions both on Glow and Lovely and Glow and Handsome. And, and we are quite excited with the change and the opportunity uh, to make a big difference to our consumers. Uh, Sirish seems to have lots of questions. So one more question from Sirish. Have we rationalized employee uh, cost uh, cost of cut employee strength in quarter one and quarter two. Uh, Sirish, we have not rationalized any employees. Uh, I think we have also explained that in the previous quarter. Uh, we we people uh, whether it's in our own business or outer core are, are crucial to us. Uh, we did take some steps in terms of pausing increments and pausing promotions. Uh, we are very clear that we want to protect our people, take care of them, and we also want to make sure that they get paid. It's also important that we create a lot of capabilities, which I think if you take a short-term view of life, uh, will will get impacted, and and we do not do that, and and we will be yeah, we're hoping that with, with business picking up and and things will come into normalcy, but we just have to work it through. Uh, Ayush, I think has got a question on cutoff date for special dividend. Uh, I think in the press release uh, we have already indicated the date. Amit, could you know what is the the date effective date for dividend? 31st July for the record yeah. date. 31st July will be the record date, and uh, they should get paid out in the month of August. Yeah. Uh, so I think we've covered all the questions which which are on the web. Uh, Amit, over to you uh, okay. to bring the call to a close. Okay. So with that, we will bring uh, to an end this Q&A session. And before that, uh, before the end, let me just remind you that replay of this event as well as the transcript is available on our industry relations website in the short way. And you can back, go back and listen to them. Similarly, a copy of our results and penny, uh, presentation is also available on our website for your listening. And with that, I would thank everyone on the call. And we can draw uh, this call to uh, conclusion. Stay safe and stay with. Thank you.